Silence is it? Aloha mai. My name is Garen Fukushima, and I am the marketing director of Ka'aha Lihui o Ole Kona Hawaiian Civic Club of Oregon and Southwest Washington. Kalo Hawaiian Civic Club is a nonprofit organization with a mission to actively participate in the promotion, perpetuation, and practice of the Native Hawaiian culture and values. One of our goals is to participate in activities which promote education and awareness to the people in our community. Through these efforts, we would like to welcome Na Kamali'i Talk Story, a program offering a safe place for open discussion and conversations around social justice, equity and equality, cultural appreciation, and many more that will be led and driven by today's youth. 
Throughout the last decade, students and their families have witnessed the, de the decline in art and literacy programs offered in our education system. As many of you know, art and literacy plays a huge role when it comes to expressing creativity and imagination. These outlets have been proven to be therapeutic and a way to keep students engaged. With the deficit in budgeting for education, we can understand that it plays a huge role in prioritizing what students need. So today, the students of Not Commonly E-Talk story posed the question, how important is art and literacy when it comes to the health and well-being of our student body? With that being said, we'd like to welcome your host for today's talk story, Sophia. Mahalo, Uncle Garen. Aloha, my name is Sophia. I'm a seventh grader in the Beaverton School District and my pronouns are she, her, hers. We would like to welcome all of you to what we hope will become a safe and open platform for many of our students and peers out there. Before we get started with today's panel discussion, as a member of this community here in Oregon, we would like to acknowledge and mahalo the land and its people that, sorry, <laughs> to which we sit and occupy. The Portland metro area rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Molala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River, creating communities and summer encampments to harvest and use the plentiful natural resources of the area. We take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land. To learn more about Portland's native diverse and vibrant community, please read Leading with Tradition, a document created by the Portland Indian Leaders Roundtable. Before we begin, I would like to introduce and welcome our panelists who will be joining us today. First, Auntie Luis Wilmes identifies as Native Hawaiian and is a member of the Oto Missouria Indian Tribe of Oklahoma. A proud graduate of Kamehameha Schools in Honolulu, college graduate of Pacific University with a BA in elementary education and a George Fox University with, with an MA in education administration. Now retired from the Beaverton District after 41 years uh, from grades K through six and 37 years and four years as title six Indian Education Coordinator. Um, she was married, um, <laughs> she's married and a mom to a three, to three and a two, two, to two. I'm happy, um, she's having a really great time supporting nonprofits like the Confluence Project and the Metro, and the Portland Metro STEM and the great people and Keiki at Kahlo and Kamehameha Schools Alumni Association. Aloha Auntie Luis. Our next panelist is a self-taught contemporary and figurative artist based in Manila, Philippines. Auntie Rachel LaRue works primarily with pencil and oil canvas, but occasionally ventures out into mixed media art. She is known mostly for her love for female form and dance, where she, where she reveals how their bodies create expressive movements that is entirely in sync with the fabric flow and form. Auntie Rachel captures motion and emotion in her work catching a single moment in a stolen second. The ebb and flow of her growth as an artist remains constant and unceasing, <laughs> resonating in the emotional expression laid out in her art. Her art journey is ceaseless and that allows her to constantly rediscover and search for the ferocity within to share the most vulnerable part of her soul. When Auntie Rachel is not in her studio, She's a mama to two children, a wife and an interior architect who graduated with a BA honors degree in interior and spatial design from Chelsea College of Art in London, England. Prior to design school, she, she spent evenings and weekends in drawing and still life painting short courses at Central St. Martin's UAL. She currently runs her own freelance interior, interior architecture and a styling business and uses time in between to escape her to her art world. Auntie Rachel's work has shown it, sorry, excuse me. Auntie Rachel's work has been shown in group exhibits like the South Arts Festival Arts Fair and an art auction at Leon Gallery. 
Manila, where her parents can be where her paintings can be found in private homes in San Francisco, Virginia, London, Singapore, Manila, and Manila. Aloha, Auntie Rachel. Ma Mahalo Nui to you both of you. As we begin, a friendly reminder to please mute while you're not talking, please raise your hand so that we can call upon you, and please free, free sorry, feel free to be completely open and honest. Okay, our first question comes from Kuule. Aloha, Kuule. Aloha, mahalo nui for joining us today. My question can be answered by both of you. Um, do you guys believe that incorporating arts and language into the school system is important? Anyone can answer. Okay, first. I'll go first. Uh, like Sophia said, um, I spent 41 years of my my life in education, especially. And uh, by the way, Kule, say hi to your mom. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, I spent 41 years in education, uh, and especially working with very young children. And so I'm, I'm going to answer this question as a teacher and Rachel with her beautiful work, hopefully will answer her, from her perspective as, as the artist. And as an um, a education uh, teacher of very young children, art played the most important role, right? How are they going to relate to what they're hearing from the teacher and their stories? How are they gonna relate for what they're reading? And uh, even reading how to even, what a letter looks like and, uh, and applying it to an artistic shape or whatever. And if, as a first grade teacher, we always taught them that this was a B and this was a D and you put it together and you got a bed. So they started to take a look at the shape and they would use their bodies even for making the, the, those shapes. The other thing is teachers and is learning styles. Some of us are visual learners and we are really uh, drawn to things visually. Some of us are auditory, we, you know, music uh, or, or whatever. And some of us are also textiles. So there's all types of forms of art that people, um, uh, gravitate towards and also students and how they're learning how to read and how it applies to a story. Um, other thing that we take a look at for the young kids is little children are starting to affirm their identities of who they are and where they fit in the world, in their family, in their culture, all of that. And their art plays a great part from art from their homes and also from the art that they also get at school in, in, in different areas and also language and language is an art form. And I looked at Rachel work, hey, Rachel, I actually checked you out on, on Instagram and I could just see language coming out from her paintings and lots of language that I'm sure when she's painting, she is saying things in her head and creating language to describe what she's doing. And that has to start at the kindergarten level as kids start to express themselves, not only from artwork that they do, but also all the other arts, the reading, writing, of course, and everything else that they're doing. So you're, how important is it? It's a very, very big part of it. Now, the question is, now we have to convince everybody that it's very important. You gotta convince not only your teammates, you gotta convince your administration, you gotta convince your school boards that it is an integral part of art because a lot of people don't think like artists, like all of you on this panel, are dancers and, and you're learning Olelo. So you are artists and you think like an artist. And so we have to convince the rest of the world to start thinking like artists. So that's a really great question. Thank you. Um, so for my part, on the other side of that, as an artist, I completely agree. I'm self-taught, um, but what what the platform that school did for me is that it, it allowed me to venture out into different mediums and to explore and to understand what it was all about. Um, it, it, it just created that platform that you could escape into and then it was up to you um, to develop it. Like you said, there's a lot of language in my dancers, um, but it's all the things that I can't say out loud or I feel that I, can't, I don't wanna say out loud. Um, and the fact that you actually saw that in the painting means I'm doing something right. Um, and yeah, there's a conversation in my head that happens. Every, every single painting is different. 
Um, and I think school incorporating that opens up so much to that. So yeah, very good question. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. That was really inspiring. And I hadn't really thought of viewing art in that way to further education. Um, if you don't mind, I have a follow-up question. Um, do you guys have any personal experiences that invigorate you to fight to provide these kinds of programs for the youth? I'll, if that's okay, I'll, um, yes, actually, because, you know, I grew up in the time and, and here, especially where the term starving artist existed and that artists can't, can't be a career. It can't, you can't raise your family on being an artist. Um, it was always a platform for your creative mind and expression. So now I feel like, I feel like the, the, the youth are, are using it to express themselves more and know that, you know, I can, I can make a career out of this. I can do something about it. And I will always fight for art programs. It's, 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 it's whatever makes you happy. It's not about, or, you know, it's not about that starving artist term. It's about what you do to make yourself happy and whatever programs there are to push for that, I think is most important. So. Well, absolutely. I believe in that importance. Um, you talked about a personal experience. As a first grade teacher, for me, I had a friend who was an, uh, an amazing artist herself. And she came into my classroom to help me um, mix some colors, paints in little jars for me. And she said, how do you want me to do it? And I went, oh, I'll just do it any way you want. So she was over there shaking around and making some colors. And I went over and she lifted up a jar. And to me, it looked like orange. She called it persimmon. And I went, oh, oh, okay, okay. And she picked up colors and it looked green to me, but she had totally related it to something else that was in her experience. So I told her slap those labels on there because I would forget what that color was because they were different shapes. There was mango, since we were both from Hawaii, she had used some Hawaiian uh, words for that. And so when the kids started to paint, I can now use that language, right? Why don't you put a little bit more persimmon on that? And they would all go running over to look at it. Unbeknownst to them, they were learning something new. They were learning something else besides orange. And I have been, my personal experiences have been just so much inspiration. You know, from the Kamehameha schools, I grew up in an incredibly enriched music program. And I thought I was gonna be a musician until I found out that I had to take I had to take really hard courses on music. And I just, I just wanted to play. I just wanted to sing and I just wanted to dance and I just wanted to do that. So I decided not to go into that. And my next love was uh, working, working with children. So, you know, you have all those inspirations that invigorate you to fight for a program because it affected you personally as the teacher. So if it affects me, it's going to affect all the other, all the other kids. The, the other one was when I was in kindergarten, and I'm so inspired by all my students and the things that they say. And one year in kindergarten, we decided to build a lion sculpture out of this huge box that we found that was almost the same size of a lion. And we started to create some paint for that. And this little kid said, oh, we're creating lion paint. And it never occurred to me that it, you know, the kids weren't calling it tan, they were calling it fuzzy, they were calling it furry, they were calling it sticky. So they were using their own language and they were having that relationship with the lion better than just brown, tan, you know, or whatever. And it was just really inspiring. And, and when my students inspired me, it invigorated for me to uh, continue on with using art art in the classroom and it just grew and grew and grew and we did all, I've done so many crazy things and it was lots of fun. And I think kids learn, learn from that. So that's a really great question. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us and fighting for the artists of the future. Mahalo Nui. Our next question comes from Haley. 
Thank you, Sophia. Uh, my concern is that many students interested in art and language don't get the chance to learn. What do you suggest they do to fulfill their need to express the arts? Go ahead, Rachel. <laughs> um, what do I say to that? There's always a chance to learn. Um, and really and truly, um, school programs are stepping stones. They're, they're really there to show you, like I said before, the methods, the, ideolo the ideologies, the technical styles, the history, you know, things that what school can't teach you is the passion. And, and really and truly for art and you guys as dancers, you have to love it. And when I say you have to love it, it's gonna make you want to learn by yourself. So in as much as I believe in programs, um, I'm self-taught, it's, it's, it's within you. Um, you are the success to your own desires and dreams. And like I said, stepping stones are there for you, but it'll never, ever, ever stop you from learning if, the, if you want to express that in, their, in the arts. So, yeah. You know, Rachel, I bet as a student though, you had a really knack for drawing and picking up a pencil. And I can almost imagine you as a first grader that you started out with, with a very intense interest of wanting to express what you, what you see and what you're thinking about. And as a teacher, to, to take that and, 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 and use that as part of their experience, teachers can grow from watching, you know, even, even children like you. But I, I'm always a person, I am probably have a little bit of attention deficit because I always flip from thing to thing to thing to thing and I never really light on something, but that's kind of what I think of myself as an artist. Do I want to rearrange the, the room of my house to, to gain more peace and more harmony or do I want to rearrange the house to create more chaos that I want I want to be a part of in, in my art and and I'm a collector and I and I see behind you Rachel a lot of rocks you know and I'm a collector too of pine cones of all things I don't know why but uh is are those rocks are those stones yeah okay anyway um they're beautiful anyway I'm very distracted as you can see anyway but I think that the like collecting and, and making your collections into things that kind of give you that that happiness that peace to to make you chuckle every time you take a look at something to think out of the box and and the summer kids you know I try to push you to do artwork that was out of the box so that there's so many things you can do to express yourself and and I and I look at art to express yourself to express how how, how you're feeling and uh, technique I've never taken a technique art class because I probably couldn't sit very still for very long to do it. But I'm, you know, it's on my bucket list to take to take a real art class and see if I can actually sit sit through the, to perfect some technique. But right now, I'm really happy just um, thinking out of the box, and that's what I think kids, you know, um, you know, I think Rachel and I, we can we can we see we're visual, so we see everything behind you too, and all of you are expressing yourselves through through things that. That you love things that make you happy and how you you know how, how you are uh, expressing yourself in your room and and whatever and you know I know everyone's on TikTok and I'm just amazed at the creativity that are coming from kids young people and what they're creating uh, to show how they're trying to make uh, understand the world and what the craziness that's going on and I think you know, to um, if you don't get a chance to learn and go to a class that like Rachel said, it's coming from within, right? And just kind of come out and do what could be fashion, it could be anything, anything that you want to do and you can call it um, art. People will push against you and say, well, that's not art, but I would pay no attention to them. Pay no attention to them. Okay, Rachel, you have a comment about that? <laughs> I do. I completely agree to that. Like no one can ever, ever tell you that your art is wrong. Who says art is wrong? You could, I mean, look at that banana on the wall with a duct tape. It, it, you know, it was art. It's up in a museum. It costs millions and millions of dollars. No one, it's, it's your own piece that is yours. No one can ever, ever say that it's not art. So I agree to that a hundred percent. 
Uh, thank you. I, I, I agree. Loving art is really the most important and it's in you for you to express. Mahalo so much, Haley. We would like to open the floor for our next question. Memo? Mahalo Nui Sophia. Do you feel that the education system should preserve accessibility of cultural aspects in art for the students? Wow. I read that question and I thought, um, oh boy. That, that now we're getting into trying to talk about, I'm sorry, I don't know how to turn off my phone. Anyway, um, to, to, to kind of balance out budgets, policy, now we're getting into politics, the politics of art education. And um, I think preserve, I liked your words, I looked at preserve accessibility. Those two terms need to probably be discussed and even amongst you explicitly, what does that mean to preserve the accessibility? Because I think maybe you agree with me, Mayma, that is not really actually happening in a great robust way in schools. And um, budget constraints, uh, when they have budget constraints, I think all parents want all the academic areas covered with the money and whatever's left over, right? So they think of art, music as maybe left over, left over, left over type to, uh, um, lessons. And that's usually the first thing to cut. But what I always want to propose is that if you're going to cut it, fine. We know the money's not there. If you can't, you know, you can't get that expensive pair of shoes. Okay, fine. I have to get a cheaper one or whatever. But with the budgets, when they, when they do that, schools need to say, okay, we have to cut it, but they need to get working on how they're going to fit that in. Are they going to ask the parents to, to get together and try and, and find money and raise funds, you know, how are they going to match it and be dedicated to, just as dedicated to finding that matching for programs, especially cultural art or, and, and kids in school that want to meet together and explore different, different kinds of art forms, music forms, dance forms, all those things that, that, that they can't really, they don't have the money to hire teachers to do. And we know that we understand that, but when I call equitable budgeting, personally, that's my definition. I can't do it, but this is what we're gonna do instead. So it's like, um, in order, this, the, the administrations, don't get me started. You know, the administration and school districts need to understand that all of their students are, are, are heart beating cultural beings with their families. And in my case, the ancestors are always having their eyes on us and what we are doing with our lives. So I don't think school boards and, and school districts think about that, but we all do as, as participants within this, in the school district. So yes, it should preserve the accessibility of cultural. How do they do it? And they need students like you to advocate. Advocate at your building level and find a, a teacher that will, find a teacher that will listen to you, push, 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 push. And it is, it's kind of tiring and exhausting sometimes because you're having to always do that advocate, but speak up, speak out, and I, think we maybe maybe we can we can make some changes in that area so it's good to see you again Mema. um our our school system is so different here but um you know we i grew up in an international school uh system where we had so many different cultures um and it's just part of our of how we grow up, it's how my kids are growing up. So on the other side of the spectrum, as a mom, um, the way my kids see, you know, they've got friends from the US, they've got friends from Netherlands, they've got friends from, they've got South Africa. There's so many different cultural aspects in their life that they can adapt. So it's a completely different um, system compared to what you guys have. Um, and it's very important. It's very important to my kids' upbringing that I will always feel that the education system um, should preserve it. However, like I said, it comes naturally to, where, to how we have been brought up. So, yeah. Mahalo Nui for your insight. 
Um, and Louise, did you have something else to say? Oh, you know, and, and in our school district, uh, Rachel, they actually created a school of the, for arts. And I think that probably is, the, I don't want to, I'm not a basher, but there was there was a, a school that's created for, for the arts. And a lot of school <laughs> districts don't have that capability. They don't have the money, yeah. they don't have, and, 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 I, and, and in fact, these girls are, are very fortunate to have that option if they want to, but if they want to stay within their own school, their, their neighborhood school, they, they will have to push for, to make sure that accessibility is only there. Maybe they don't want to go to another school they want, but the international schools I'm very familiar with, and, and because so yeah. many cultures are there, they can't escape it, right? They can't escape that issue. They have to deal with that issue in some capacity. So excellent. Correct, yeah. your, your kids have a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you again for your responses. I think this is a reason why we started Not Completely Talk Stories so that the youth could have a voice in many different topics. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Memo. Our next question comes from Vincent. Uh, thank you, Sophia. So as someone who's not really into the arts and is more like an, a, like an introspective guy who like criticizes art, uh, my question is, do you see any cons of adding culture to art? And do you see any consequences of that happening or not really? Well, we always need a critic, uh, Vincent. You're very important. We're very, very important. And that's your art right there. There's your art right there. Anyway, your art will be becoming a, um, maybe not a critic, maybe just being, you know, an observer. And, and, and having your opinion. So that's kind of funny that you said that. And yes, the biggest con in, in, in our, in, in here in the States is stereotypes when you get into cultural art and being a protector of um, the art, of, especially of the native people. And people like to take it and commodify it. In other words, they like to take the images and create them as their own and then and sell it off. And that is a really big, um, issue amongst indigenous cultures, even in Hawaii, that's, you know, what is what belongs to the people of, the, of that culture? And, uh, and how, how do you uh, teach that with the respect and the honor that it should be taught? And how do you uh, replicate that? Um, so the stereotypes of the culture, I want to make sure there are no more paper bag Native American vests made at Thanksgiving, no more paper feathers. And teachers call that cultural art. I want no more um, at Cinco de Mayo where you have paper serapes and sombreros and, and, and because the Mexican culture is so rich with color and vibrancy and, and, and you know and amazing things. And I want all that stereotype stopped as cultural art and it's our job to call that out. And, and I think in education that's been called out quite a bit because that has kind of um, gone away as they're starting to look to uh, Native, Native American uh, uh, groups like I'm part of and they're asking for guidance on how to create better, um, better art. My opinion is look to the masters and you know try not to recreate it when you're six when you're six years old that is just not in your thing but looking at it and talking about it is something that that, that can happen and I think you're right about the art needs to come from the cultural values that a culture has and you know in your culture you want us to honor your people and your ancestors and what they did for art. And you want us to handle it with, with respect. And when we don't, when we take it as our own, which happens a lot, and we say, it's, it's, this is part of my art program, when you didn't even ask, you know, maybe your family for permission to use something that came from your family. You know, that is, that is something that I think as indigenous folk or people of color, that's a very big, important part of our lives. So, and teaching that value is where it's perfect. That's the true part where we're not, um, you know, we're having a truthful depiction of the culture when you use the, the traditional values of especially the car. So I'm speaking more to schools that use culture called what they call cultural art. Uh, I'm more speaking to that kind of area. And I'm sure Rachel has a, a very big opinion on that too. Thank you, Vincent. Vincent, I have to say that we always, as artists, we need people like you because it's what, it's what makes artists grow. It makes us develop and strive to, to move forward. So 
that's a good thing. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the, the Philippines is it's the same. We have so much culture. Um, the, it's 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 hard to tap in there. I know when I was trying to develop a um, a collection, I wanted to to as you know, I draw dresses and I and I play with fabrics, and I wanted to tap into Filipino fabrics. But I'm always trying to be careful with that. You know, am I doing it right? Am I going to, am I going to acknowledge it or disgrace it? So it's 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 difficult. It's a difficult thing to um, tap into because you, especially if you want to get out there, you always have that nagging thing in your head. You don't want to upset anyone. And I think you mentioned that always like you, you. You, you want to be careful and don't want to step on um, disgracing the culture. Um, but I agree, schools do it everywhere, everywhere in the world. They do that. Um, that when it's a holiday, it's, it's you know, like you said, like the paper bag things, they do that here too. Um, yeah. I will be, you know, you think we've got a lot of different uh, cultures that they have, they, they, try to make everyone happy in the, in the classroom. So, yeah, I hope I answered the question correctly, but. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for trying to keep up, trying to, when you guys both noted that like, there has to be a balance between sharing it, but also respecting the culture at the same time. Like maintaining a good balance between those two values. Thank you, Vincent. Kino will be asking the next question. What are your thoughts on why art programs are being shared in school for all ages? Oh, I got all kinds of thoughts. <laughs> And I, I, I'll follow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, um, I don't know exactly what your definition, girls, of art programs. Uh, there's art curriculum that uh, happens, and then there are art programs. So you know, there, there, that is two different things. Art curriculum is when the the school district pays for it. Art programs is where they try to find volunteers. I think to to kind of work on that. But this is where I'm talking about equitable funding is that if they can't have a robust art curriculum for a school district, you're too small, you don't have enough money, they need to uh, find an art program. And an art program, in my opinion, is when you get a group of people together that advocate, find money, get volunteers, get donation for materials, and they get the art program out into the schools. Either teachers are being the teachers or they, they find the teachers and they know, and because this group of dedicated people believe that students will thrive in an, an art curriculum. And in our school district here in, or in Beaverton, we have a art literacy program very much run by volunteers and the district is better for it as we start to at the kindergarten through fifth grade level kids are moving on with just a lot of uh, knowledge of artists and and what the, and how they how they uh, what they're noted for for their art so that was art programs and then there's art curriculum that is done in the schools and I as a student in high school had to take art as an elective right but I was mostly a music student so a lot of my electives were in music instrumental art and um, vocal art, vocal music. Anyway, but I took my one art class as a senior and every time I tried to do the project, not that I did it wrong, I did it wrong because the, like, uh, the, the teacher was a very, very critical because I, of course, am a person that does everything out of the box. So I didn't do it exactly like everybody else. And my symbolism was very confusing to the teacher. Anyway, so you know, I kind of went, eh, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not going to be part of a, a, a formal art curriculum lesson. I can just go off and, and just kind of play around with my own. So uh, they are being shared, you're right, Kina, in the schools, and teachers are trying their best. They are trying their best. And uh, 
I think that um, import, important for all ages and all kids get them. So uh, that's a great question to think about. Another thing you can put on your advocacy list of asking at the school if they, you know, people can volunteer to come in and do art programs. So good question, Kina. It's good to see you again, Kina. Hi, Kina. Um, so for me, I'm on the other side of the spectrum again of this question. Um, at school, I had I had the best art teacher. Um, when we got to high school, we had to choose um, we had to choose whether we wanted to do it or not as a higher level. I did ID art, um, and somehow, even though I didn't choose it to do my career, I chose it as a as a higher level. My art teacher was from New Zealand, beautiful Kiwi lady who in the Maori culture, like, you know, it's very similar to your, your culture. Um, it's just, it was just about letting go and being free. And in a way she turned the curriculum into a program, like what you were explaining. And it allowed me just to explore rather than just, okay, this is a curriculum. You have to follow it. I mean, there are things you have to do, right? Um, and then I compare it to my son, Kina, to Cameron, who um, he's not an artist per se with, with art like mine. Um, and he, well, I mean, provided that everything's on Zoom at the moment, which is really difficult. Um, he, he gets frustrated with how technical things are and how there's no freedom to it. So that's the same as what you're saying where curriculum is so structured that sometimes people feel a little um, suffocated from that. And kids, I think maybe if you don't, Maybe Vincent can agree to that. Like, if you're not into arts, you may feel suffocated. And that's not the whole thing about arts. That's not what it's about. And so programs where you have volunteers, it's, it, I feel like it's a little bit more flowy and liquid and organic. And I feel that that's where the programs, you, you, it's a choice about being there. And I think that's, it's the organic part of art. I think that's very important. And I hope more programs are encouraged. So it's more about if you wanna do it, you can do it rather than you have to do something. So, yeah. I always like I it when- I answered your question, Kina. I always like it when students, as they become adults, like watching my own children grow and finding out that how much designing a garden has, has been very satisfying as far as color and what plants are gonna do, that kind of thing. And so it, you, you're right about the organic part that we keep forgetting about stuff in our personal lives that we, um, that we kind of use as our art. We may, like Vincent, we may never be an artist, but we use art in our lives to uh, make our lives sometimes more bearable when we're not feeling very bearable, you know, we're not able to handle what's going on and we can turn to our pine cones and our rocks and all these kind of fun things that we have to kind of create that, uh, to make life a little bearable. So um, yeah, Kina, good question, girl. Thank you. It's clear to me now that the difference between our programs and our curriculum is very different. And sometimes in art, you have to follow it a certain way. But me personally like to just go free with all the colors and designs. Thank you. I just have something to add to that one. Um, it's not, it's like if you put it, cooking as an art, it's like, that's an art, right? And it's about throwing things in there and just, oh, you know what, let me just taste it. That's also an art in itself. We're not just limiting ourselves to visual art, like you said, with the garden. So even if you apply it to cooking, so that's, I just wanted to give that sort of example as well. Thank you. I think... I like doing art on a paper and I love expressing myself in hula. So that's another one of my arts. Thank you. Thank you, Kina. Um, I agree. Um, even like art, art itself is very, con it, the word itself kind of makes me think of just paper, pencil, all that. 
but that is not what I'm into at all. I'm, I love to sew and do all that stuff. And a lot of people, you know, it still takes hard work and determination. And yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, our next question is from Chloe. Thank you, Sophia. Um, have you ever experienced a time in your life where you have seen parents who disapproved of having more art or language classes and wanted to replace them with uh, more academic classes like math, science, and lang language arts and health or PE? And if so, how did you behave based off of that response? Well, yes. <laughs> um, you think in 37 years, I haven't heard a lot of different, all kinds of things from parents, uh, but um, I never had that. Probably because I taught first grade and, and parents are a little confused about their little one anyway. So that, you know, uh, they, they didn't really say, oh, no more art. But I was, um, I was very explicit. And I mean, I was very intentional that the art matched whatever we were doing. So if the children were learning to read Clifford books or whatever, we were taking a look at a little bit of how to draw a dog. And let me tell you, when a kid learns they can draw a dog that looks like Clifford, they think their world is just amazing. So but there is some little technicality in, in drawing or whatever. But the other part is taking other content areas, like when we studied penguins and we made life-size penguins made out of paper bags. And we used math and we used all kinds of things. We painted penguin paper and we made, you know, it, it became uh, the, te the parent, I kind of tricked the parents into thinking that, uh, that they were doing a project, but it really was the language that we used was based on art and, and what they were learning in their art literacy program that I could kind of use that, copy the language from that. And parents weren't necessarily aware of what was embedded into the, um, into the academic work, right? And I think in the kindergarten through fifth grade level, we can do that a little bit better than maybe as you get into the middle and into the high school as the academic courses become a little bit more focused. Um, yeah, man, I never, as you can imagine, I was not an, al I went to algebra and that was it. You know, I thought I would like geometry a little bit better because it was shapes, but the way it was taught, I thought, well, if they had, if they had showed you how to build a house or, or something, maybe I would have understood a lot of how the, how the angles are relatable to each other and how they relate and et cetera. I think I could have gotten it and, and I had to wait to be an adult to actually kind of, uh, you know, figure, figure all of those things out. So, you know, teachers, uh, I push as if I, when I have young teachers that come into my classroom as student teachers, I would push for them to access art and access art, access the, the doing of an academic area so that the kids can find the, um, the stuff interesting, right? You want to be interested. You want to, you know, you can you can read about penguins and look in a book, but now you're going to build a, a penguin, you know, a king size penguin, and how are you going to make it? What materials are we going to put together to do that? So they have to learn materials and measurement. They have to learn all kinds of things in order to create that. And one year, and um, yeah, one year we read about a prehistoric penguin. This is in first grade. And one kid, you gotta always have one, said, let's make one of those. And that penguin, prehistoric penguin was seven and a half feet tall. And so uh, I had a, a parent that I worked with and we said, okay, how are we gonna do this? And we ended up um, actually pulling it off and having a seven and a half foot penguin built in our classroom. But the, um, the art and the, the way that kids saw that visualness, I think, um, you know, the parents didn't really know because I kind of tricked them into, into, into that. So, um, you know, I really haven't had anyone that said no more art. I want only math or whatever. Uh, but um, I don't know. Maybe parents didn't want to be in my class because they saw more art <laughs> going on. I have no idea. And it, and it was all fine. It's all good. Okay. Thank you, Chloe. Um, I really like this question because um, in the Philippines, you know, and I think it's a very Asian thing where as a child, it's like, okay, you have to be a doctor, you have to be a lawyer, you have to be an accountant or, you know, 
I luckily my parents never held that with me, but um, I'm going to move away from my art at the moment. And as an interior designer, my parents always knew that I wanted to do that. But then my dad said, right, before you go to design school, you have to go to business school. So I thought, okay, am I gonna do business school? And sure enough, I think I was 21. I was not ready for that. Um, and I wanted to use what I had growing up, use that as a uh, as my platform. Okay, well, I learned this, I learned math. I fast forward now to in order to run my interior design business, you need all those backgrounds. So you, as a creative, I have to take my creative hat off sometimes. Be like, right, how am I going to run my business? So math, science, language arts, all of those play a part. Most recently, when I decided to focus on my art business, guess what? It's a business. It's not just about art. It's taking time away from the studio, away from creating, again, taking that hat off and understanding the backside of it. So it, it's, I don't think, I don't think either one should be disapproved. They coexist side by side and they have to, otherwise, you know, you'll live your life just doing one thing. It's, it's about doing everything and having that healthy balance. Um, and so, like I said, luckily my parents allowed me to have that balance. There, there are people, um, people I know who were not raised like that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you both, um, Auntie Rachel, like with what you said, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, I know like a lot of different people who are like forced to take art band classes as a young kid. And then when they get more into it, they're expected to like veer off into like more, you know, I guess, economic jobs. And um, so uh, I guess kind of a follow up question for both of you, how much say should parents have in a child's decision to go into the arts more or not go into the arts? Well, for me as a mom, um, and my kids are starting, my, my son is 12 and my daughter's eight. And I always try to, um, I, I love this question. It's, yeah, it's, it, you know, I try to, say to them, you can be anything that you want. You can, the world is your oyster. However, as parents, you also have to be able to guide them, not tell them what to do. Um, so we're merely guides, because you know, as you get older, you learn more, you know? And I always thought, I always thought when I was younger, I know everything. Um, then I became a young mom. And I still thought I knew everything, but you don't. You're, it's always a learning curve. And I think if you're just there as a, to carry them through, I think you're doing your job already. So. Thank you. And, and Tilly, did you have anything to add? Well, you know, I agree with Rachel. It is really hard when you become a parent of, of what to say and what to what not to say, especially if you are the one who's paying for it, you know, and you want to pay for that. So that that becomes that becomes a discussion, and and hopefully parents will have that discussion with their students, especially and then and, and and you know, Chloe, that you would understand that your parents are you know taking out a huge loan or whatever uh, for for art. But I agree with the, the combining, and I think that's a great your dad was, I like your dad, Rachel. So he says, if you're going to do art, you got to take business because he understood the, the, the connection between, between the two. My son was the one who took a, a class and who, who graduated from the university in a, in, with a degree in journalism. And he said, I should have taken a secondary degree in business. You know, it didn't even dawn on him, didn't even dawn on me. And I thought, well, that was a bit of a great idea. He took he took it in multi, he took a journalism class with multimedia 
minor. And he said he should have taken a business minor instead with the journalism and that he could con continue on with his art of journalism and also understand the business thing. So if you if you have art, you better come with the arguments, Chloe. But what if I take a business class too? Maybe your parents will step back and go, okay, you're actually thinking of paying, uh, you know, uh, taking care of yourself. As parents, we want our, we want you kids to be able to take care of yourself too, if we're not around. So we want to make sure you have that in the back of your head. So you better have those, you know how you play cards? Okay, I'm going to do art school, but I'm, can I do a business course? Can I take computer computer science with that or whatever? You can, uh, you know, take it for, uh, for to uh, have your parents seem to support you in that area. And if you have a parent says, go off and be an artist, have fun, then you better go fast, girl, and don't come back, go quick, <laughs> before they change their mind. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Um, just, to add on, just to add on to that though as well, now after finishing school, after um, leaving art for a while, I'm still learning. I'm still, I'm doing an art business course at the moment. So if you don't do it, then you can still do it now. There's so much time. It's, it's, you can never stop learning about those things now. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess kind of listening to what you want to do, but also listening to the people who have lived longer than you and <laughs> definitely know more about how the way things work, obviously, because they have been working people before. So thank you. Just and we have, we have experience of tricking our parents too. So we've done it too. So don't worry. <laughs> we've been there, we've been there as young people too. So we understand what's probably gonna work out. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Um, the next question is from Eleni. Thank you, Sophia. My question is, if there were no longer a wide variety of art and language programs available in our schools, what kind of impact would that have on our community communities and how would it affect the next generation? I would say, oh my, it would be boring. It'd be very, very boring in a lot of capacity. I just wrote down the answer to the, oh my, it would be boring. There'd be no music. There'd be no beautiful buildings. There'd be no gardens. There'd be no, no you know, no images. There'd be no photographs, you know? So uh, uh, it would affect, I think, our future generation and it would probably harm in, 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 in all of us creating our personal identity and our personal worth if we can't um, enjoy a, a garden or, or a beautiful forest that's been developed so that you can enjoy it. And it also will affect, I think, our personal strength if we don't have things that feed our souls and feed our hearts and souls and feeds our ears and our eyes, it doesn't feed us so that we can, like I said before, we can take on, we can take on some bad news a little bit easier when we can, um, we can use art to kind of help us with that. So yeah, it would, the impact would be just, there was a time called the dark ages and it was dark for a particular reason because there was none of this stuff happening at that time in the, in, in the world. So, and it, it, it had to come out of the dark ages. It had to come out when we had the Renaissance, which was a beautiful light place of art and, and, and wonderfulness. So it, historically, you can see the impact. Go back and take a look at this part of uh, world history. And it, it, there was some very bad impacts and what the Renaissance and what happened since then uh, also happened. So it's a little history for you there. So I had a simple answer for that. And my answer was just life would be black and white. That's it. You know, and so I agree to everything that you just said, but that's what it would be. Life would be black and white if there was no art. So, yeah. But I think, I think you would even agree 
that not just in color form, but in opinions, in the way we relate to each other, it would just be black and white. Every it would just be, uh, uh, uh. and uh, you know, all houses might be the same. You know, everything would just be um, boring, boring, but uh, also um, just not very. Um, that's not very human, anyway. Anyway. Thank you to both of you. I completely agree that we need art in our lives to be human. We need a spark of joy, whether it be, um, even if you're not that into art per se, you be just looking at your surroundings, you still see art everywhere. And I think it's an important aspect in everyone's lives. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. that. That sounds really sad and I, I appreciate that there's so many leaders and mentors who are fighting for the arts. Our next question is from Kohoku. Mahalo Sophia. My question goes beyond the school system. How can art support mental health issues we are seeing in our generation today and those before us? So maybe I can start with this one. Um, I'm a huge advocate for mental health. Um, and I feel like they sit comfortably side by side art and mental health. Um, because I'm a huge believer in allowing yourself space to breathe. And I feel like art, no matter what, what kind of art you do, it supports that belief. Um, because it's just about searching deep down yourself and how to understand your own thoughts, emotions, state of mind. So if, if you're painting, you just immerse yourself in that and go back to the beginning of our conversation where there's language in my art. There are hidden words in my dresses that I paint. And sometimes they're in my titles. Sometimes they're just left for me. In your dance, when you guys dance, you're in your own head. You're in your own movement. And all of that supports your own mental health. Whether, whatever your own definition of art, that is yours. And I, again, we knew earlier. Um, so mental health is a stigma here still. I know it's more open there, but it's a stigma here. So I feel that here people use it a lot more because they don't talk about it as much as they do over there. So it's, that's very important. So I don't know if you watched the inauguration <clears throat> this morning, but uh, there was a young poet laureate and O-M-G, you know, that's all I can say is the way I, I was scribbling down her phrases that she was putting together, that she put together. And she even said she stole some phrases from the musical Hamilton in, into this, her poem that she wrote. And I was just looking, uh, she's 22 and she's been doing this for most of her teenage life. So she, you know, obvi obviously she's been working at it for a long time. It's not, you can't just wake up and say, I'm gonna write a poem and I'm gonna recite it at the inauguration. That's probably not gonna happen because she actually has been working at it and her life uh, probably, you can see her color of her clothes. I thought, oh God, this girl sees things and is very visual and she acts on her visualness. But I kind of wrote exactly what Rachel says that mental health, we need something when we're having a hard time to sort out our thoughts. And it could be in painting, like Rachel does a, a painting. It could be in poetry, even listening to it. It could be mu music and people go to music a lot when they're trying to sort out what, what they're feeling and so trying to sort out their thoughts. And then, uh, you know, taking a look at, I like to call it physical art, like, uh, of taking a walk and looking at buildings, decorating your space to kind of suit your mood, to kind of move your mood around. And, you know, my husband hates it when I do that, but I always tell him I'll be a happier wife if he would just 
move all the furniture and redo the whole house. No, but it would it would actually improve the mood and it would improve relationship. You want to improve your relationships in some way too. So, you know, you want to create, like Rachel said, you want to create peace. You want to create love, like she says with her, her artwork and, and, and happiness. And uh, yeah, we can we can have that and get people through some difficult times. So remember to do that. If a friend's not having a bad time, I always try to do it with jokes. I like to write a lot of jokes. So, you know, that is, um, you know, you can, um, I love memes, right? I love memes. Create those great and send the right meme to your friend. You raise their spirit up. I, I just think I'm just enamored with things that are online that are, are creating great uh, um, uh, happiness and peace and love and information for people. So I'm, I'm really for all that to help with mental issues. And it is re really, really tough. And I agree, Kahoku, um, Kahoku that um, art can help with the, those mental issues. Keep that in mind, girls, when you're feeling kind of down or even when you're feeling happy, but you can kind of turn to some music or art to, to help you out to get over that. Mahalo, I totally agree. Just having that outlet like you, um, for you, like for yourself, for others, it's good for like mentally, emotional, just have that outlet and yeah, music is also a great one in art and just like sitting down, looking around like like nature or like buildings or other people's arts. That's also one thing. So, yeah, I totally agree. Thank you, Nancy Ray and Nancy Louise. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I can't believe Kohoku and everyone here just can look outside and see so much art and beauty. And sometimes it's just so hard, you know, all you can see is clouds or rain or I don't know, just something negative, but it's so, it's really just beautiful. But anyway, before we close- Well, Sophia, now the Hawaiians, the Hawaiians have like 52 to 60 words for rain. So once you start getting into this, come on, you can get into rain, you can get into clouds. Come on, girl. There's <laughs> I know, I know it can feel that way, but it, 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 is real, uh, it, it is real interesting when you take a look at weather. But of course, I'm a geek, so I look at crazy things like that, so. No, I think that is so cool. And when you're in that like sad or just not happy state, it's so cool how many options and opportunities you have and different things you can go off of. But uh, yeah, just just to close, I wanted to ask you guys if you had any thoughts on how the pandemic has affected art programs. Globally, everywhere around the world. Well, for me, I know, and for everyone, we were all in the same boat, which is the first time that any of us, anyone can say that, that we're all experiencing in different cultures, we're all experiencing the same thing because of the pandemic. So when March hit, everything was at a standstill, lockdown, quarantine. Um, and people were anxious and didn't know what to do. And people ended up finding a way to make things work and opened up a world that none of us expected. I mean, I never thought in a million years I'd be sitting talking to you guys. You know, it, it's it's just opened up so much. So I tried to, and I just released a collection called Silver Lining because the pandemic, what the pandemic created was a silver lining to all of this. And I it just opened up and it made the world, for me, it was my art world. And now all of a sudden, you guys, it's just opened up my world so much more than what it actually is and what I allowed it to be. So in some ways I'm mad at the pandemic, but in some ways I'm grateful for it. So that's how I feel about it. Well, you know, I, I agree. <clears throat> I agree with Rachel and what I viewed is being with some nonprofits and how it has opened up like uh, authors that we uh, have always been um, so enamored with 
could come and talk to us online. And in, instead of waiting for them to fly out here and get a hotel, blah, 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 they were able to give us their time and, and uh, just like in this forum. So these forums that are starting to happen, girls, this is a, you guys have this art form down. There's a, there's a template that you're designing and you're applying content and questions. And it is just really, really awesome what, what you, you guys are doing. And I toured the Louvre. Louvre, maybe I'm mispronouncing it, but in, in France, I'm, I may never get there, but I feel like I, this is about the closest thing that I could ever get there. And I, and I just saw somewhere that the Met is opening up an online um, tour also, and I'm like, I'm there. So, cause I may not get there either. So, um, so, so that like uh, Rachel said, there's so many more opportunities have opened up around the world now the world can come into your little computer in your little in your room and you can you can have an interaction to it and i am just really um I'm really excited about that. And it's also, um, also, but it also now for me, it went back into my home and I'm, I'm making a joke about, you know, um, rearranging the furniture and stuff, but I probably wouldn't have of course done that without, even though I'm retired, I probably wouldn't have done it. I probably would have been busy, 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 and I wouldn't have done it. And when my mother passed away, I got a lot of her Native American jewelry, just beautiful earrings. And, you know, and I never wore them. I never wore them, but I got them out and took a look at them and tried to rethink how I could uh, honor my mom, who I, uh, I got these uh, pieces of jewelry from her and that I could actually use it into a uh, fashion or, you know, I wear them around the house now. My husband goes, where are you going? I know I'm just going to put them on. You know, I'm going to put them on and wear them anyway. So, um, so that that has brought that out that I'm actually beginning to to uh, you know not only look at globally like you're saying, um, uh, Sophia, but also taking a look at home and and things that I have here and and now re rediscovering. There you go, rediscovering things that you have. So, um, you know, it affected. It's probably making. I think kids now are going to go into their art classes. I hope with a a wider uh, uh, view, and I, I don't know, Vincent. Maybe if you had tour the Met and like online, maybe maybe you would be interested in art. You'd be a better critic. There you go. There you go. You could be a better critic when you look at really when you look at good art and uh, or some of the masters and and Rachel's work too, and you know and look at all of that and you can make those decisions. So um, yeah, I think um, the pandemic has affected, like uh, Rachel said, and kind of mad you have to be here, but you know sort of like well since I'm here, I might as well do something creatively about it. And and because I think Rachel and I are kind of artist people, that's the first place we go to. How can I do something creatively? That's the first thing that pops in my head. I don't spend, I don't spin my wheels in, in that area. And um, it's a curse because you're always doing something and uh, you know, you're always keeping very busy and trying to create things to, to create your space. So um, Sophia, that is, that is a great question. And I'm sure, uh, you know, a lot of artists are feeling the same way as Rachel is. I agree so much. Um, there are most definitely two sides of this pandemic. For me, getting inspiration is from like other people and going outside and experiencing the world regularly or ha as I used to. But I never would have, you know, be given any opportunities like Nakamali Talk Story and am able to express myself and find, you know, what I love because that a lot of that happened during this time. So thank you so much. And before we close today, I would like to invite our students who helped put this together to introduce, introduce themselves. Kina. Aloha, mabuhai. My name is Kina and I'm 10 years old. I go to school as a fifth grader in the Hillsborough School District. I identify as Filipino and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Thank you. Aloha, my name is Mema. I am 14 years old. I am freshman in the Beaverton School District. My pronouns are she, her, hers and I identify as Japanese. Mahalo. 
Aloha, my name is Suhohu. I'm a sophomore in the Beaverton School District, and my pronouns are she or hers, and I identify as Native Hawaiian. Thank you. Aloha, my name is Ku'ule. I'm a junior in the Beaverton School District. Um, I'm 17. Um, I identify as she, her, and hers. Aloha, my name is Noe Lenny. I am a freshman in the Beaverton School District. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I identify as Native Hawaiian and Japanese. Aloha, my name is Chloe. I am 15 years old and a freshman in the Beaverton School District. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I identify as Mexican and Puerto Rican. Uh, Aloha, my name is Haley. I am a sophomore in the Beaverton School District. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I identify as Japanese and Portuguese. Uh, hi, my name is Vincent. Um, I'm 14 years old. I go, to, I go to a school in the Beaverton School District. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I identify as Vietnamese American. Mahalo nui loa to our amazing panelists and to all the youth that join us. Sophia, we can't hear you. Platform as a safe space for all youth to come together and talk about the issues that we, a key component of today's society, are faced with as we move into the future. No subject is off limits. We hope to continue these sessions monthly and we need you, our peers and friends and family and family. For more information or always, sorry, <laughs> it's super really. Um, please be involved by hui nkts at kalohcc.org or visit www.kalohcc.org. Again, mahalo for joining us and we will see you next time.